Good evening and warm greetings from India to all the participants and viewers of today's keynote address on civility and the law. Honorable Judge Thomas B. Griffith will deliver the keynote address as part of the celebration of International Teaching Month hosted by the Institute of Law, Nirma University. The motto of the International Teaching Month is celebration of law, life, and diversity. As we mark this celebration, we acknowledge that different groups of people look at realities differently. In spite of this multiplicity, and I borrow this from Judge Griffith's paper on civic charity and the constitution, are we able to ensure the idea of inclusivity, community over the individual, public discourse that cuts across regional, religious, racial, and ideological boundaries? These questions are pertinent in today's charged times, and therefore, deliberation upon this crucial topic is essential. With this, I would like to let the audience know the distinguished guests of our keynote address today. We have with us Honorable Judge Thomas B. Griffith, former federal judge of the United States Court of Appeals, District of Columbia Circuit, USA. Sri Hiren Bhai K. Patel, Managing Director, Nirma Limited, India. Dr. Anup K. Singh, Director General, Nirma University. And Dr. Purvi Pokharyal, Director and Dean, Institute of Law, Nirma University. I now take the opportunity to invite Professor Dr. Anup K. Singh, Director General, Nirma University, to deliver the welcome address. But before this, a short introduction is required. Professor Singh did his PhD from the University of Allahabad and postdoctoral fellowship from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Sir was a visit visiting scholar at the JL Kellogg Graduate School of Business Administration, Northwestern University, Evanston. Sir has many publications to his credit and is also a recipient of various awards for teaching excellence. Sir, if you could please go ahead with the welcome address. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Uh, Honorable Judge uh, Griffith, Professor Barnes, Shri Hirin Bhai Patel, Professor Pokhriyal, faculty colleagues, and dear students. The three stand of uh, law in any country are uh, liberty, fraternity, and uh, equality. And that's where this whole notion of uh, inclusiveness becomes very important. And uh, I'm glad that uh, Judge Griffith is going to talk about it. So far, uh, India is concerned. Our uh, Republic was concerned about this issue from the very beginning because uh, we had a history where certain uh, sections of uh, the society were excluded from the mainstream. So we brought in reservation to empower certain people then uh, there were uh, people of uh, third gender, they were also excluded. We empowered them. And uh, then uh, we also focused on empowerment of uh, women, which is, which is still continuing. So in India, our uh, lawmakers are making efforts to increase the scope of inclusivity and uh, to ensure that uh, people from uh, uh, not so mainstream uh, sections of society are included in the mainstream of society. So uh, with these words, uh, I again welcome uh, Judge Griffith and I look forward to listening to his uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now request Professor Dr. Purvi Pokharyal, Dean and Director, Institute of Law, Nirma University, to introduce our eminent guests on the online days. Ma'am, please, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shreya. Uh, good evening, uh, dear friends, and good, good morning, Judge Griffith and uh, Dr. Stephen Barnes. Uh, friends, uh, we are deeply honored to have with us uh, Honorable Judge Thomas B. Griffith. 
and it's my pleasure to introduce him uh, very briefly. Uh, judge Thomas B. Griffith served as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit from 2005 until his retirement from the bench in the year 2020. Judge Griffith born in, in Japan and his father was a US Army officer. Judge Griffith graduated from Brigham Young University in 1978 and served on the Virginia Law Review at the University of Virginia School of Law, where he received a Juris Doctor in the year 1985. Judge Griffith worked in private legal practice, which he subsequently left to serve as a Senate legal counsel, and then subsequently the Chief Legal Officer of the United States Senate. As a Chief Legal Officer of the Senate, Mr. Griffith represented the Senate, its committees, members, officers, and employees in the litigation relating to their constitutional powers and privileges, advised committees about their investigatory powers and procedures, and represented the institutional interest of the Senate in the impeachment trial of the President Clinton. As a federal judge, Judge Griffith brought a broad range of experience to the District of Columbia Circuit. He has experience in civil and criminal litigation as well as as a regulatory matters. Judge Griffith also worked in the legislative branch and assisted in projects dedicated to international legal reforms. During his tenure as a federal court judge, Judge Griffith has given some notable opinions. For example, in Kiamba versus Obama, dissenting opinion from the panel holding that court cannot issue a writ of habeas corpus to prevent the transfer of Guantanamo detainee a country where the detainee claims he will be tortured or further detained. Judge Griffith argued the suspension of clause entitled Guantanamo, a detainee, to notice an opportunity to challenge the lawfulness of the proposed transfers. The other notable opinion uh, is in Elbel Alliance for Better Access to Development Drugs versus Von Ishanbek. Judge Griffith found that there is no constitutional right to experiment drugs and upheld the FDA's policy of limiting access to such drugs as rationally related to the government's interest in protecting patients from potentially unsafe drugs. Currently, Judge Griffith is a senior advisor to the National Institute for Civil Discourse and also a lecturer of law at Harvard Law School. At Harvard, he takes a course such as the role of the Article Three judge, wherein Judge uh, Griffith explores the proper role of federal judge under the US Constitution when exercised the judicial power of the United States conferred by Article 3 of the Constitution. Judge Griffith has frequently volunteered his time to pro bono service and public service groups, tackling important and complicated legal is issues of the day. Dear friends, we are indeed honored to have with us Judge Griffith. At this occasion, we are also uh, uh, honored to have Sri Hiren Bhai Patel. Sri Hiren Bhai Patel is uh, associated with her university as a prime member of the NERF. And let me introduce briefly Sri Hiren Bhai Patel as well. Sri Hiren Bhai Karsan Bhai Patel is an MBA with specialization in finance and marketing and holds a bachelor degree in chemical engineering. And both these degrees are from USA. Sri Patel joined Nirma Limited, the family owned company as a director in the year 1998 and became the managing director of the company in the year 2006. His strategic leadership, vision, and business acumen helped Nirma surge as a con 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 conglomerate with about $3 billion in revenue. He plays the key role of managing the overall operations of the group with hands-on approach and projects and strategic investment for inorganic growth, including consolidation, diversification, and acquisitions. Sri Hiren Patel devotes time for a number of social humanitarian services and social upliftment activities. His personal efforts in building an exhaustive HLA typing registry for peripheral blood stem cell is notable among his social contributions. Being an active member of managing committee of Nirma Education and Research Foundation, Sri Hiren Patel provides an inspiration and a great vision to the education initiatives of Nirma University and Nirma Vidya Vihar. Thank you so much for joining us Hiren Bhai. Now I would request Judge Thomas Griffith to deliver his keynote address. Thank you. Thank you. I have just lost my video. Can you see me? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
Okay, I don't know what's happened. <laughs> Let me get out of that. Um, can you still see me? Yes, yes we can see you. Yes, yes. Yeah, I can't see you. I don't know what's happened. So I, I will proceed uh, apace if that's, if that's okay. Um, I am honored uh, to be here. I, I'm speaking today from my uh, office in, in Washington, D.C., uh, halfway around the world. Uh, I'm, I'm honored to be part of this, uh, of this conference. I'm, uh, the, the more I've learned uh, about NIRMA and what, what you are doing, uh, it's inspiring uh, to me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm honored by the Dean's kind introduction, grateful to, uh, to be in the presence of, uh, of Mr. Patel, who is a, clearly a visionary uh, leader in his support of uh, the university and legal education uh, in particular. And I'm also grateful for my, my good friend, uh, uh, Stephen Barnes, who uh, helped, helped, helped arrange this. Uh, so as, as you've heard, my remarks today are going to be on something called civic charity uh, and the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I apologize in advance uh, because my, my talk is going to be rooted and grounded in the American experience. I, I hope you'll not uh, accuse me of being uh, parochial uh, or limited in my view, uh, but, but I, I know the American experience best. And I think there are lessons from the American experience that are universal uh, lessons that can be applied uh, in, in, in any nation that is trying to create uh, a sense of unity of its people. So, uh, so, so, so my remarks today will be about the American experience, but I, but I hope, I'm certain that they'll, they'll have some greater application. Um, uh, I, I frequently get asked uh, when, I, when I speak with, uh, with people outside the United States. Uh, how is the United States doing? Um, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid uh, the answer I give to folks is not a happy answer. Uh, the present state of American society is not good. Uh, several years ago, Professor Amy Chua from uh, the law school at Yale University wrote a book by the title of Political Tribes, Group Instinct and the Fate of Nations. Uh, when uh, I know Professor Chua well, and, and as she uh, described to me and as she's described to others, uh, the creation of this book, it was originally intended to be a critique of American foreign policy uh, in, in, in various parts of the world on the grounds that uh, rarely had American foreign policymakers taken sufficient note of political tribalism in the region of the world where they were urging an American intervention. Uh, and so as Professor Chua was doing her research for this book, she created a matrix. What, what are the, the factors that go into the creation of political uh, tribalism? She was planning on writing a, a book about American intervention in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East and, and, and elsewhere, uh, using this matrix to identify uh, regions where political tribalism was present, uh, but American foreign policymakers hadn't taken adequate notice of it. As she was doing the research for her book and came up with this matrix, she came to the realization that the matrix that she had created to describe the presence of political tribalism fit her own country as well, fit the United States of America. Uh, that was a, a, a surprising and uh, discouraging uh, a moment for her, but it also gave her a focus to her work uh, going forward. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, who's a, uh, a social psychologist who's uh, at New York University in the United States of America, wrote a, a book several years ago that had a, a large impact uh, in the United States and elsewhere called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and religion. Uh, uh, Dr. The focus of Dr. Height's research in the last decade has been on division. Why is it that people sort themselves into different groups? Why do certain people think so differently uh, one, one from another? Um, uh, Dr. Height is a generally optimistic fellow. He identifies problems and works for solutions. Uh, therefore, it surprised me recently to read 
to read of an interview that he gave to an Australian newspaper in which he said this, and I'll quote from Dr. Haidt. There is a very good chance that in the next 30 years, America will have a catastrophic failure of its democracy. We just don't know what a democracy looks like when you drain all trust out of the system. We don't know what a democracy looks like when you drain all trust out of the system. Um, I'm 66 years old. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a scholar, um, but I'm an observer. Uh, and in my 66 years of being a careful observer of the political life of the United States of America, I can remember growing up during the Cold War. Uh, I remember the protests to American intervention in Vietnam. Uh, I remember the civil rights movement very well. Uh, I remember Dr. King, the foremost uh, American acolyte disciple of Gandhi. Um, I, I remember the controversies that, uh, that plagued the United States during the, what we call Watergate when Richard Nixon had to resign for his criminal acts in office. Those were all traumatic events uh, in, in the United States of America. I remember all of them. I, I say that by introduction to the statement I'm about to make. In my lifetime, I have never seen the United States of America at a more perilous moment than it is right now. Because what we are seeing is what happens when you drain all trust uh, out of the system. So that's the backdrop for my remarks. Um, I'm worried, I'm deeply concerned uh, about the state of the body politic uh, in America today. And so I'm going to address my suggestions about what to do, what to do when a nation is bitterly divided along political lines, along economic lines, along racial lines, along religious lines. What can a democracy do when it's lose, when it's, when the trust is being drained out of the system? Well, at a minimum, at a bare minimum, we should be civil to one another, right? At a bare minimum, I like this statement from an American commentator named Peter Weiner. Weiner writes, civility has to do with the respect we owe others as fellow human beings. It establishes limits. So we don't treat opponents as enemies. And it helps prevent us from the temptation in politics and in life more broadly to demonize and dehumanize those who hold views different from our own. It's the end of, Professor, of, of Wainer's quote. So at a minimum, we act civilly one towards another. But there's more that we need to do than act civilly. Uh, the American pundit Arthur Brooks commenting on this remarks, if I were to tell you that my wife and I were civil to one another, you would tell us, get some counseling, right? get some counseling. Civility is a, a necessary step, but it's the bare minimum. Uh, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna rely for my remarks largely on the scholarship of, uh, of, of two young uh, American scholars. Uh, uh, one is named Derek Webb. Uh, he studied at uh, Stanford Law School under Professor Michael McConnell, one of the most distinguished uh, professors of constitutional law uh, in America, and, and himself a former uh, uh, federal judge. Uh, I'm gonna rely on, on uh, his student, Derek Webb's scholarship for the next part of my remarks. And then I'm gonna rely on the scholarship of, uh, uh, of another academic, a, a scholar I met when I was the general counsel at Brigham Young University. His name is Matthew Holland. Uh, I'll talk about his work uh, in a minute, but first let me tell you about uh, uh, Mr. Webb, Derek Webb. He wrote an article, it was published in a law review several years ago, it was called The Original Meaning of Civility, Democratic Deliberation at the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention. As you may know or may not know, uh, in the summer of 1787, uh, delegates from 
the various states in the United States of America met in Philadelphia, uh, uh, where Mr. Patel studied, um, and not far from where Professor Barnes is, uh, met in Philadelphia and there drafted the Constitution of the United States that was later ratified by the people of the United States in the states, uh, in the states around the country. But the, the, the heavy lifting, uh, the drafting occurred in the summer of 1787. Uh, many accounts are given of that summer and those events, uh, and we have a good sense of what took place. And it's a remarkable story uh, from which we can learn great lessons. I think all peoples can learn great lessons. Let's start with this. It was in July of 1787. The delegates of the convention had been in Philadelphia uh, for several months. It was a hot and humid summer, uh, unusually so. And the convention was on the brink of failure. Um, George Washington, who was the presiding officer at the convention, met with two other, uh, met with two of the delegates of the convention in early July and remarked that, quote, a disillusion of the convention was hourly to be apprehended. In other words, at the beginning of July, it looked like failure was about to occur. The convention was not going to succeed in creating a constitution uh, that for, the, for, the, for the new country. And yet in September, two months later, they had succeeded. George Washington wrote a letter transmitting the draft constitution to the Congress, also assembled in Philadelphia. And this is the description George Washington gave of how the delegates were able to achieve success that summer. He said, the Constitution is the result of the spirit of amity and mutual deference, which the peculiarity of our political situation rendered indispensable. The spirit of amity and mutual deference, according to George Washington, that's how the delegates were able to succeed that summer. Now, the next question is, how did the delegates create a spirit of amity and mutual deference? Derek Webb looks to three key factors in that summer. The first one was sociality. Um, the delegates were gathered from around uh, the United States, but housed together in what was then a fairly small city, one of the largest cities in the United States then, but Philadelphia was not a teeming metropolis at the time. I, I think there were somewhere between 25 and 30,000 people uh, living in Philadelphia. And they did not have a hospitality industry. There were not many places for the delegates to, to board. And so they ended up boarding together, crammed together in a few boarding houses in Philadelphia, sleeping in the same room, often in the same bed. They lived in close quarters with one another not by choice, but by necessity. The convention met every day, uh, Monday through Saturday. They, they, Sunday was the, the Christian Sabbath uh, for the delegates. They didn't, they didn't meet on, on Sunday, but they met Monday through Saturday, generally speaking from 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon. Then they broke and they went and dined. They had dinner. Same problem that they had with the boarding houses. There weren't many places to eat in Philadelphia. So they ended up eating together every day. Afterwards, they would have tea together in the evening. They were British after all, right? So they had tea together uh, in the evening. After a few weeks of this, they started to form dinner groups. Groups of delegates would get together and regularly have their meals together, and regularly have their tea together in the evening. Now, these groups were, were sort of randomly chosen. They weren't chosen by political ideology. They weren't chosen by region. They were just sort of thrown together in a haphazard uh, fashion. But they had meals together in these small groups every day of the convention. At key times uh, during the convention, Benjamin Franklin who did live in Philadelphia and had a very nice house 
would throw open his house for a lavish party. He would bring in the best cuisine that he could obtain. And apparently he, he owned a, a, a prize winning stock of port that he would bring out uh, and, uh, and, and, and the delegates would enjoy. And, uh, and, and the, the volume of the discussion uh, grew, grew as they were having a, 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 a glamorous, a wonderful time uh, one to another. One of the delegates to the convention named George Mason wrote to his son, a letter to his son about all this socializing, having dinners together, having tea together, and then having these wonderful parties on occasion at Benjamin Franklin's home. He said of these, of these events, they allowed us to grow into some acquaintance with each other and form a proper correspondence of sentiments. So the first thing Derek Webb points to in identifying what, what created the spirit of amity and mutual deference that allowed the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia to succeed was sociality. They socialized one with another. The next factor he looks to were the rules of the convention. Here were some of the rules that were imposed, that were agreed upon uh, to run the convention. First of all, attendance was mandatory. If you were in Philadelphia, you had to be at the convention. You couldn't decide to take a day off and maybe ride a horse into the countryside. No, no, if the convention was scheduled to meet, you had to be there. Second, there was a rule that when a speaker held the floor, no one else was allowed to talk. No one else was allowed to read. No one else was allowed to work. The idea behind mandatory attendance and the rule that when the floor is held, everyone needs to listen. The idea was you wanted people to pay attention to one another, to listen to one another, to try and understand one another. The other, another, two other rules that were, that were by which the convention was run is the convention was held in secret. There were secret proceedings. The public was not allowed to watch. No media was there. The doors were closed. The shades were drawn, which was difficult because it was so hot in Philadelphia, but they closed the windows. They wanted to have the proceedings in secret. On top of that, the votes that were taken throughout the convention were not recorded and kept. No official record was taken of the votes. The convention was held in secret, no official record taken of votes. Why? That encouraged the delegates, gave them the freedom to change their views. The idea being maybe they had a certain view on a certain topic in May, but by July, after having listened to their colleagues debate the merits of that topic, they could change their view and they wouldn't be embarrassed about it. No one would call them a hypocrite, right? Uh, there would be no pressure from their constituents uh, that, to hold fast to their original idea if the later idea was a better one. Um, so the sociality and the rules of the convention helped create this spirit of amity and mutual deference. But the key moment, I believe, comes from Webb's third factor. What saved the convention from disillusion was they came to a compromise over the, the most significant stumbling block to compromise in the convention. And that was, what is the representation of the states in the Congress? Should the states be represented equally so that the large states have the same type of representation as the small states, or should they be represented proportionally based on their population? Well, the compromise that was struck was that they created a lower house in which the states were represented proportionally by their population uh, and an upper house by which the states were represented equally. We call that the great compromise. It's not the terms of the compromise that I want to speak about today. It's the way they reached the compromise. Because the, the records and journals 
and publications of those who attended the convention tell us that before the terms of the compromise were reached, the delegates decided that they would compromise, that there would be a compromise to save the convention. They decided they were not going to let the convention dissolve. Where did they go to carry on their discussions to create the compromise? Benjamin Franklin's home, right? 11 delegates were chosen. It was a small group who met in Franklin's home. And the delegates that were chosen were chosen because they were moderates. They were known to be moderates. They were known to be people who knew how to compromise, who understood the value of compromise. The 11, 11 moderates meet in Franklin's home and they come up with the terms of the great compromise. But the lesson that I draw from that, the most important lesson, I think, is that the most fundamental impulse that created that constitution was the desire to create a union. The preamble of the Constitution of the United States announced that the purpose of the Constitution was, quote, to create a more perfect union, close quote. The delegates of the convention in Philadelphia in 1787 agreed to compromise for the sake of union before they knew what the terms of the compromise would be. That, to me, is the great insight from the Philadelphia Convention. In doing so, in deciding that they would compromise for the sake of union, these delegates tapped into a powerful strain of the American DNA, a concept called civic charity. For that, I will now turn to the, the, the works of, of, Mac, of the, the book of Matthew Holland. It was his doctoral dissertation that he, he wrote at Duke University was later published by Georgetown University. The book is titled Bonds of Affection, Civic Charity and the Making of America. And Professor Holland looks to four critical moments in the making of America in which, in, in which those who were involved displayed the power and the importance of this concept, civic charity, love of others in society civic love. The first, the first uh, event he talks about is from the spring of 1630. It was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, John Winthrop, a Puritan minister, uh, was the, the leader of that colony, and he gave a sermon on board the ship, the Arbella, that was, that, and, and which the, 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 the first members of the Massachusetts Bay Colony traveled from Europe uh, uh, to, 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 to America. Uh, Winthrop's sermon is sometimes called the Ur text of American literature. Many consider it to be the most important foundational piece of American literature. Uh, Winthrop, in that sermon, called upon his colony to live with each other, quote, in the bond of brotherly affection. And then he went on to say, we must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other. We must make each other's conditions our own. We must rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work. Scholars have pointed out that with that sermon, John Winthrop created a national myth about him in America. The myth is that humans are social beings, dependent upon other social beings, not just to survive, but to flourish. The next moment Holland speaks about comes from March of 1801, the first inaugural dress of Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, the author of the Declaration of Independence. Um, scholars have seen in Jefferson's first inaugural address, as he's about to become president of the United States in 1801, his most developed and revealing statement 
concerning the foundational ideas of American politics. Scholars don't look to the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson's most famous writing, to see what, what he thought most deeply and profoundly about, about American political ideals. It's to his first inaugural address. Let me quote a brief passage from that. Uh, it, to set the context, the election of 1800 it is to this day the, the bitterest uh, and, and nastiest uh, uh, presidential and most divisive presidential election in America, American history. And yet it was the first time, the first real test of whether American national power could be transferred without violent resistance. And, and, and it was, and, 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 and America is proud of the fact that there have been over 200 years of peaceful transfer of power, which what makes the recent events so awful uh, to us. Uh, because it's a step backwards in that, in that critical uh, feature of, 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 of democracy. Well, Jefferson, having won the election uh, of 1800, facing a country that could have very easily have divided at that very moment along fractious political lines, says this. He's referring to the two parties that were extant in America in those days. One was called the Republican Party. The other was called the Federalist Party. With that background, here are Jefferson's words. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. Let us then, fellow citizens, unite with one heart and one mind. Let us restore to social life that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. Weeks later, in private correspondence, Jefferson wrote this. It will be a great blessing to our country if we can once more restore harmony and social love among our citizens. I confess, Jefferson wrote, as to myself, it is almost the first object of my heart and one to which I would sacrifice everything but principle. The third event occurred in March of 1861. On the eve of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, the greatest president in American history, gave his first inaugural address as he was about to take the office of, of president. It was a last ditch effort by Lincoln to preserve the Union. Seven of the states had already seceded from the Union by the time Lincoln made these remarks. He wanted them to come back and he wanted to keep others from seceding as well, appealing to what he called the better angels of our nature. Lincoln uttered these words, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Stirring words, Lincoln failed. Civil war came, and America lives with its consequences to this day. The fourth moment Professor Hava refers to is in March of 1865, four years later, the same Abraham Lincoln. Now on the eve of victory in the Civil War, Lincoln gave his second inaugural as he was about to be begin his second term as president of the United States. Of course, we know sadly that weeks within giving the second inaugural address, he was slain, he was assassinated. His second inaugural address has been described by scholars as without precedent in the civil history of the world because it reached a generosity that was so grand and, and unexpected as to, to nearly defy human comprehension. In the face of understandable cries for vengeance and retribution against the rebellious slave states, Lincoln pledged a different course. His words, with malice towards none, with charity for all, let us strive to bind up the nation's wounds. 
Civic charity, it's an idea that runs deep in the American DNA. How do we call upon it today in the United States of America, a time that many feel is as divided as it has ever been since the Civil War? There are many polls, much social science data that shows that America is divided in so many different ways. How do we draw, draw upon civic charity today? I like these words from a political commentator named Michael Gerson. He writes, the heroes of America are heroes of unity. Our constitution is designed for vigorous disagreement. It is not designed for irreconcilable contempt. I want to emphasize that point by Gerson. The, the Constitution of the United States creates a structure of governance that encourages vigorous debate. The premise is that such debate results in human flourishing. But the Constitution assumes the coming together of a people who want to create a community despite their differences. That's the assumption. Without this desire to unite, the Constitution cannot create the national community in which the flourishing will occur. Without this desire to unite, I believe the Constitution of the United States is all form. It's no substance. Remember what Washington said, the spirit of amity and mutual deference is what created the Constitution. Let's go back to that summer of 1787. The key moment was the decision to compromise for the sake of union before the delegates knew what the terms of the compromise would be. The work of unity, that decision to compromise before you know the terms of the compromise, that is the animating spirit of the Constitution. In the United States, all office holders, all members of the military, and indeed all lawyers take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. I believe that that is an oath that expresses a commitment to work for unity. It's a solemn pledge to God and to our fellow citizens that we will not be agents of division. In fact, the Constitution itself tells us this, how important compromise is. The, the Constitution itself was born in compromise. Both sides in compromise need to seek convergence, and neither side can seek total victory. But each side needs to find ways to accommodate the legitimate concerns of the other. That is the spirit of amity and mutual deference that created the Constitution of the United States. Without that commitment to compromise, the commission will fail. I'd like to contrast the, the approaches of two uh, members of the, distinguished members of the faculty at, at, at Harvard Law School. The, the one is a former dean of the law school, Martha Minow. Uh, dean Minow has written extensively about the importance of compromise and accommodation uh, in, 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 in America. And she's taken on maybe the most difficult issue in, in American public life today. How do you pursue uh, freedom of religion, which is a, a hallmark of, of, of American democracy, at the same time that you, you guarantee equality of opportunity uh, uh, to, to, all, to all people, particularly to, to racial and uh, and sexual minorities. Sometimes those two are in conflict. The, the religious liberty of one group may come into conflict with the equality of opportunity of a sexual minority. What do you do in, in, in that instance where, where you have this, this clash of interest? Dean Minow has written extensively and persuasively that you need to compromise both sides need to compromise. And what that entails is that we need, as citizens, we need to be brutally honest about what our core interests are. 
And we need to be able to give up those things that are not core for the sake of another group so that they can realize their core interests. That's hard work. It's accommodation. It's the only way compromise can occur. That's Dean Minow's approach. Let me now share with you the approach of one of our colleagues, another distinguished professor, Mark Tushnet, who sees things very differently. Professor Tushnet writes, writes, quote, the culture war is over. They lost. We won. Taking a hard line, you lost, live with it, is better than trying to accommodate the losers. The war is over. We won. Contrast Professor Tushnet's approach, not only with Dean Meadows, but contrast it with Martin Luther King, America's most influential disciple of Gandhi. Dr. King wrote, our purpose is not to defeat or humiliate the opponent, but to win his friendship and understand. There may be no better expression of civic charity than Dr. King's words. The most dominant theme in the Federalist Papers, these were the, 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 the documents that were written by Alexander Hamilton of, of Broadway fame, and James Madison sometimes referred to the, uh, the father of the Constitution. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison wrote a series of, of papers for, uh, for, for newspapers in the state of New York as New York was deciding whether to ratify this Constitution. Uh, those papers, they're called the Federalist Papers, are generally regarded as the most valuable insight into the, what, what the framers of the Constitution, the, 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 the people who put the Constitution together in 1787, what they intended, what they, what they hoped to do. The most dominant theme, there were 85 Federalist Papers, the most dominant theme in those papers is warning about the evils of partisanship. Of the 85 Federalist Papers, 55 of them talk about the concerns of partisanship. In the most famous Federalist Paper, Federalist Number 10, James Madison observed that partisanship was the main reason republics had failed in the past. And Madison's goal in creating the Constitution was to avoid that happening again, to avoid extreme partisanship destroying this republic. In Federalist 85, Alexander Hamilton wrote that the most important feature of the Constitution itself was its restraint on partisanship. Hamilton thought that was the most important insight, the most important function of the Constitution was to restrain partisanship. But he believed that the separation of powers, creating three branches of government that were separate from one another and, and, and worked as checks and balances on another, he thought the greatest value of that was that it would create the wisest policies because you would have to have broad support. A simple partisan majority would not be able to, to succeed under the constitution that was created in 1787. It was Madison's view that coalitions were more likely to create wise policies than with merely partisan government. Now, in conclusion, Professor Chua is optimistic that America can overcome its tribal politics. I'm afraid I'm not so optimistic. I'm hopeful, but I'm a skeptic. Quoting from Jonathan Haidt again, he observes that the human mind is prepared for tribalism. We are deeply intuitive creatures whose gut feelings drive strategic reasoning. As it turns out, a multicultural democracy is not a natural condition for us. At best, it's a fragile possibility. And our leaders and scholars need to keep that in mind at all times. It's a fragile possibility. What you're trying to do in India 
what we're trying to do in the United States to create a multicultural democracy. But we have to try. We have to try. Uh, at the end of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Benjamin Franklin, who was the wise old man at the convention, told his fellow delegates that it was going to be hard work to keep the republic they had created. It was going to be hard work to keep it. I believe that hard work requires civic charity. I also believe that we can do hard things. May I, in conclusion, draw upon two religious traditions that play a vital role in American life? The first comes from the Christian tradition. In 1968, Robert F. Kennedy, who was the younger brother of the slain president, John F. Kennedy, himself ran for the presidency. Uh, sadly, uh, he was assassinated during the campaign and died. But as he began his candidacy, he announced his candidacy with these words. I want the United States to stand for the reconciliation of men, the reconciliation of humankind. The word reconciliation is an interesting word, has interesting origins. Uh, William Tyndall in the 16th century translated the New Testament of the Bible into English for the first time. He used the word reconciliation in his translation to translate a Greek word. I do not read or speak Greek, so I'm going to mispronounce this. The word is katalasso. The word means a change from enmity to friendship. It means working for harmony. Tyndall translated that as reconciliation. But on occasion, he translated it with another word. There was a word that had been newly created in the American language, and Tyndall borrowed it for his translation. The word was at one month. At one month. Atonement. Atonement. Now, from the Jewish tradition, and this comes from a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Shmuley Hecht uh, in New Haven, Connecticut, who teaches me that in the Babylonian Talmud, a three-year-long debate between the houses of Hillel and Shammai was ended when a voice from heaven declared, the utterances of both houses are the word of the living God but the ruling favors Hillel for three reasons. The rabbis ask, how can that be if both Hillel and Shammai understand the word of God? How can God choose the reading of Hillel over the reading of Shammai? We don't understand. To which the response in the Talmud is, the utterances of both houses are the word of the living God, but the ruling favors Hillel for three reasons. First, his words were kind and modest. Second, Hillel studied the arguments of Shammai. Third, Hillel explained and discussed the arguments of Shammai before his own. The lesson, the Lord favored Hillel, not because his understanding of the law was superior to Shammai's, but because Hillel's approach showed respect for Shammai and thus worked towards unity. According to the Talmud, unity is more important than the particular view advanced. Civic charity runs deep in the American DNA, but it doesn't belong to America alone. It's a concept, it's an idea that undergirds the rule of law. The whole purpose for the rule of law 
is to create a community in which human flourishing can occur. We create that best and only when we agree to compromise for the sake of unity, when we agree to give up some of the things that are dear to us so that things that are dear to others can be realized in their lives. It's hard work, it's important work, but it's work that's required of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Judge uh, Griffith, for a brilliant and awakening talk. You know, this kind of a message is deeply embedded in our uh, Hindu tradition as well. In our Sanskrit, we say that Vasudheva Kutumbakam, so the whole world, you know, is my family and in the family, being a members, you know, we always try to adjust and adapt certain things. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and especially I remember that, you know, we are living in this uh, most profound and perilous days of our lifetime. And we have had several wake up calls and thanks to the Corona, the COVID-19. And at this juncture, I just, uh, re I'm reminded of uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, once uh, he said that unite with one heart and one mind, restore to social intercourse, that harmony and affection without which liberty and even life itself are but dreary things. And that's why he called it a social love. So thank you so much, Judge Griffith, for a brilliant talk. Uh, now, before we move to the question answer session, I would request uh, Sri Harin Bhai, Irene Bhai Patel for a presidential remarks. Hiren Bhai. Thank you, Purvi Bhai. Honorable Judge Thomas Griffith, former Federal <laughs> Judge of the United States Court of Appeal, uh, District of Columbia. Professor Stephen Banj from Penn State University and is also an honorary global professor at nearby university, faculty, uh, students of uh, Institute of Law. It is my pleasure to be the part of a session during the International Teaching Month. Globalization requires shedding of wealth, knowledge across professions and disciplines. Nirmai University has a vision of accelerating internationalization at the core of its academic uh, activities. We encourage more dialogues and academic interactions with other foreign universities. Uh, Nirma University has been celebrating the International Teaching Month for, uh, for almost last uh, four years. Uh, it serves as a platform for convergence of diverse culture, knowledge, and uh, professions. It is beneficial for the stakeholders in developing holistic understanding of the knowledge system. The world is a global village and which has shrunk even more in the times of pandemic when we all have come together uh, over the internet like the one that we have today. Uh, in the present time also the university understands the scholarly pursuit must empower uh, students to contribute to the development of the country. It should enable them to make uh, a mark for themselves in uh, <clears throat> any corner of the globe. Therefore, the global exposure that activities like this gives will facilitate students to not only secure, but also create jobs in India and across the world. Judge Thomas Griffith uh, just delivered a very thought-provoking uh, keynote address. Uh, we are grateful to the judge uh, for delivering keynote address during this uh, uh, conference today. In the present times, the need for such a civility in public debate uh, is pressing. This culture must be embodied not only in individuals' uh, discourse, but also in uh, democracies as uh, large. We certainly owe respect to other fellow human beings and should be open to accept um, the views of those that are different uh, from ours. It was a great uh, to host uh, Judge Thomas Griffith, and we cordially invite you to the campus very soon and look forward to see you again. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you very much. 
Shreya, we may take the question and answer session now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, Judge Griffith, now we have received plenty of questions, some of yes. which I would like to pose to you. The yes. first question is by one of our students, Mr. Prithviraj Singh Zala. And he says that Professor Michael Klarman, in his foreword in the degradation of American democracy and the court, writes about how the law enables judges to rationalize positions coinciding with their political views. What is your opinion on the political nature of judging in today's America? And shouldn't democracy and rule of law be the bottom line to make a decision rather than partisan views? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked that question. You made reference to uh, uh, an article in the Harvard Law Review by Professor Michael Klarman, who is one of the most distinguished professors of constitutional law in the United States of America. Um, his, his article, as you said, is titled The Degradation of American Democracy. Uh, I was asked by the editors of the Harvard Law Review to write a response to that piece. Uh, and my piece was called uh, The Degradation of Civic Charity. Uh, and, and my response to Professor Klarman was very similar to the remarks that you've You've heard today, uh, Professor Klarman uh, has a, a far too pessimistic view of the state of, uh, of, of the Republic. And, 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 and he doesn't want a way out. He just wants us to go further and further down the partisan, uh, uh, partisan path. And that, that's the nature of my response. But the question that you asked is, is, an, is a critical question, is an important question. Uh, in, 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 under the Constitution of the United States, um, the premise is that the people of the United States will make the rules by which society will be governed. It, 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 it won't be done by a king. It won't be done by an aristocracy. It won't be done by a pundit. It won't be done by a priest. It won't be done by a religious leader. It'll be done by the people of the United States through their elected representatives, right? They make the laws they decide the rules by which society will be governed. The question is, what is the role of a judge in that system, right? And my view is that the role of a judge in that system is a very small one. It's a very limited role. It's when parties have a dispute between each other, they bring that dispute to the judge and the judge decides who wins and who, who loses according to the rules the laws created by the people of the United States through their elected representatives, not according to the judge's own sense of what is right and what is wrong. But if you'll allow me a story, um, in the United States, the way you become a federal judge is three things need to happen. You need to be nominated by the president of the United States. And then you need to be confirmed by the Senate of the United States. Uh, and then you need to be appointed by the president. This story I'm telling you comes from the day after I was confirmed by the Senate of the United States. It was a very happy day. Um, there had been a debate on the Senate uh, about whether I should be a judge or not. And, and, and uh, they thought I should. And so I was very happy. I, I was in my, my office at Brigham Young University. Um, that day and I was the recipient of many wonderful telephone calls of people congratulating me. It was a very, it was a happy day. One of the calls came from a friend of mine who uh, had been a law clerk for a judge on the court I was about to join and then later for a justice on the Supreme Court. And he called and he said, Tom, let me give you some advice. He said, it's the advice my judge gave me my first day in his chambers when I clerked on the DC circuit. He sat me down and he said, here's how we go about our work. We study the facts of the case as best we can because these are real people and they deserve to know that we hear them and that we know who they are. That's the first thing that we do. The second thing that we do is we think long and hard and deep about the fair result, the just outcome 
the equitable disposition. Once we figured out what that is, then we go find law to support our decision. Well, the purpose of my friend's call was congratulatory. It was not to engage in a discussion about the proper role of a judge under the Constitution of the United States. But as I hung up the phone that day, I took a vow that I would do my very best to heed the first part of his advice, to learn the facts of each case as best I could so that people would know that they were being listened to. I took a vow that I would do my very best to totally disregard the second part of his advice. No, 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 no. I'm not a judge so that I can decide what's right and wrong and fair and just. I have views on all of those topics, but those are irrelevant under the Constitution of the United States. No, no, as a judge, I'm supposed to take what the American people have decided is right and fair and just as they've put it into law through their elected representatives and use that to decide the case. When I, when I don't do that, when I give in to the temptation to say, oh, I think, I'm, I think I have a better sense of what's fair and just than do the American people. So I'm going to decide the case. That ruins the whole system. That ruins the whole system. And so, so I have strong feelings about judges who give in to that temptation and, and decide a case based on their partisan preferences. I can happily report that in the 15 years I was on the DC circuit, which is sometimes called the second most important court in the nation, right? In those 15 years, I never once, once saw a judge make a decision based on his or her partisan views. Now, we disagreed about many things, right? And, and, and we have different views about how you read the Constitution, what it means. And so we divided on those things, but never once did I see a judge who was appointed by a Republican president say, oh, I'm gonna side with the Republican view on this. Never saw that once. Now. I'm not certain that I can say that about our Supreme Court. That's a problem. That's a problem. Thank you, Judge. Your experience uh, coupled with the answer was really in insightful for all of us. Uh, due to the paucity of time, we will take one more question. And uh, this is by Mr. Harsh Bhushan. He says that, as we know, civility in public discourse is very important. But nowadays, it is very difficult to maintain such decorum in dialogues. Uh, what are your views on the present situation of the kind of public debates that are happening in America? They're awful. <laughs> they're just awful. No, they're, they're terrible. Uh, and it's, it's bad. Uh, uh, Arthur Brooks, who's a commentator I, 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 I like a lot, um, uh, it, it, it talks about the outrage industrial complex. And what he points to is American media, particularly cable media, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, that, that, that these media outlets uh, have figured out how to make money. And the way they make money is they have breaking news every 10 minutes. Well, there is not breaking news every 10 minutes, except on those outlets. And, and what they do is they figured this out. Uh, it's part of our human makeup that our attention is drawn to the outrageous, right? Our attention is drawn to anger. Our attention is drawn to people waving their arms and being indignant. Uh, and so what they do is they gin up controversy. They love to, to take a partisan side and belittle and berate their opponents. And they all do it. This isn't just Fox News. MSNBC does it as well. CNN does it as well. What they are doing is they're, they're, they're appealing to like-minded people, getting them outraged so that they'll watch 
and their advertising revenue goes up. That's what it is. It's, it's, it's entirely driven by the desire not to do well for the country, but to make, to make money for themselves. It's just insidious. And, and unfortunately, it's driving a lot of the discussion in, in American politics. So, so what's needed? What do you do? Well, the first thing that you do is you don't participate in that. When I'm speaking to American audiences, I tell them, if you're getting most of your news from cable networks, stop it. Stop it right now. You are being played. You're being played. Stop it. The bad news is, and this is bad news, it's hard work to keep up with things. You have to read. You have to read. It, television news is for entertainment. It's not, it's not for becoming informed. So the first thing that I tell people is stop watching cable, okay? And the second thing is be nice. Be nice to people. Bef don't, when you're at that family dinner and politics comes up, do not try to persuade your uncle. He's not going to be persuaded. It's not going to work. Instead of trying to persuade him, try this. Try to understand him. Okay? Try to understand him. Just listen to him. Ask why he believes what he believes. And don't try and persuade him. It's not going to work in the short term. In the long term, it might. If we can dial down the rhetoric, if we can create a spirit of amity and mutual deference, maybe it'll work. No one is ever persuaded by someone who hates them. We are persuaded by people who respect us and love us. So if you want to persuade someone, respect them, love them, and be prepared to recognize that you may be wrong. You may be wrong. Anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you, Judge Griffith. That was an answer which has very simple advice, but as humans, I think we have our limitations and we need to work on that. Uh, and we must try to. Uh, with this, I would uh, wrap up the question and answer session. Uh, but now I would like to invite Professor Stephen Barnes, who has been instrumental in the execution of the International Teaching Month, to deliver his, his special remarks. Uh, for the audience, Professor Barnes is Assistant Dean of Graduate and International Programs, Penn State Law, Pennsylvania University, United States of America. He oversees the LLM and SJD admissions. He's also Global Professor, Institute of Law, Nirma University. Before his appointment, Professor Barnes lived for eight years in China, where he was a visiting law professor at the China University of Political Science and Law in Beijing, and also served as Penn State Law China Programs Director. Professor Barnes, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Shreya, and Namaskar, uh, Sri Patel. Uh, Singh, and to uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Purvi Pokaryal, and to all students who are gathered from around the world, and to Judge Tom Griffith. And I'm now going to take the liberty to say, I don't know the judge as the distinguished jurist that I know he is, but I know him as a friend. You know, there is a word or a phrase that we use in... Uh, here in American culture, and I think I've heard it translate many different languages, and it goes like this. You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? And I'd like to use an example from uh, Judge Griffith's professional background to illustrate that point of a person who walks the walk. You know, we just finished, you know, a very, very charged impeachment proceeding and where everything seemed to go off the rails. And of course, it was a very monumental, a sad event that triggered all of this. But when uh, Judge Griffith in the late 90s, he was appointed as Senate legal counsel to another impeachment proceeding. And this was the impeachment proceeding against uh, then President Bill Clinton. Now I'm gonna shorten this story quite a bit. And I think I've got it mostly right, but it was also a very charged atmosphere. 
Democrats, Republicans. There are questions of jurisdiction and fact, whether, you know, this was even, this should even be in the Senate chamber. Well, Judge Griffith, then the lawyer, was appointed to be on the Senate Legal Council, and he had to kind of draft all the rules that the Republicans and Democrats could agree upon. I mean, imagine that, the factions or the tribes that Judge Griffith talks about. But he was able to reach that compromise that he talked about that go back to the convention and also modernly with Mahatma Gandhi. So anyway, the, the, the trial goes on and um, President Clinton is acquitted. Now, when Judge Griffith, a few years later, is nominated to join the, the Court of Appeals, he would have, as we would say, a lot of nice political baggage <laughs> to carry with him. And there'd be plenty of reasons for senators on either side, or even the lawyers or the members of the Bar Association to stand in opposition to Judge Griffith. But notably, notably, the people who supported him were senators on the, on the Democrat side who felt like there shouldn't even be an impeachment trial. They filed very strong letters of support. And even the lead counsel for Bill Clinton supported Judge Tom Griffith's appointment to the court. So you talk about how you, how you bring people together I think there's no better example, I think, in, in Judge Thomas Griffith's professional life than what he did in the late 90s. Now I'm going to transition very quickly to this, if I might. And I know I'm embarrassing uh, Judge Griffith, my friend Tom, when I say this. Um, I'm going to go from talking and walking to bicycle riding. So it was like some 12 years ago that my parents, who were neighbors of Judge Griffith, they said, hey, Stephen. One of our neighbors is coming over to Beijing and he's a bike rider. I think you'd find him to be very enjoyable. And it's like, oh, by the way, he's on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So I had two immediate responses to this. Number one, having lived in Beijing as long as I did, I had so many family and friends who'd say, hey, Steve, or hey, Stephen, I have a friend that's coming over. Can you show them Beijing? And it's like, you know, look, I am not a tourist guide. I live and I work here, but there was this perception that I was some kind of a tour guide. There was that number one reservation. The number two is, are you kidding me? Me, the lowly lawyer and son of my parents, I'm really gonna be taking a judge from the DC circuit, spend a day with him. What do I have to say? What do I have to offer? He's just way above my, my, my level of understanding of the law. But I made the email connection with uh, Judge Griffith, and he'd been off the plane for three or four hours. So now I'm going to take you. He, he meets me near my little flat, the alley where I live, and I'm going to show him Beijing. The thing I've learned about giving these Beijing tours is I have these two and four and six and eight hour turnaways, meaning if this person is not interesting to me, the tour ends at two hours. <laughs> if the person's getting annoying, the tour ends at four and so forth. And so I didn't know, I, on my side, I thought I might just have to tell Judge Griffith that, that at the fourth hour, you know, I'm just, you know, this is over my level. You know, I, I can't talk about Marbury versus Madison on mile 30. But in any event, what I will tell you is, and I'm gonna do this for the very first time in my life, I am going to overrule a federal court judge because when he said he's not a scholar, just an observer, what I observed during that not two hour, not four hour, not six hour, not eight hour, not, it was a 10 hour bike ride over about 120 kilometers was this. He's very well read. He's a preeminent scholar. And the way I noted that was not, we didn't talk about the law. We were talking about the things he noticed with his fresh eyes. I remember on this very same bike ride, and Judge Griffith remember this, we were even talking about Anna Karenina from Tolstoy. And I thought to myself, here I am in Beijing, riding past the Imperial Palace, and this judge is talking about Tolstoy. 
it was just amazing. And, and the bike ride was so good that I texted my friend, Thomas Mann, who's one of the leading transactional lawyers and jurists in China. And by the way, he is going to be a speaker in this forum next week. I said, hey, Tom, you've got to meet this other Tom. This is amazing. And then he graciously came over with this child and we met for, for tea. So when I say that, I just want to say at a, at a, at a very personal level, um, I'm grateful that there are people like Judge Thomas Griffith who are skeptically optimistic. And this really puts us in the rails between reality and aspirations. And as a friend, I'm just very grateful that um, Judge Griffith was able to make time to make this forum happen. I'm grateful to be part of this forum. You all far, 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 far overstate my involvement here. I'm just kind of in the middle and I just enjoy bringing people together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Barnes. And with this, we come to the end of the keynote address for today. I now take the opportunity to express my heartfelt, heartfelt gratitude to Judge Griffith for this insightful and precise talk on civic charity, especially in the light of our constitutions. Community, union and unity, atonement, compromise. These are words that you have given a fresh perspective to. Though the perspective of your talk was the United States of America, it can even be juxtaposed on the Indian state of affairs. You have left us with much to think and deliberate upon. I would also like to take this opportunity to, th to thank Sri Hiren Bhai Patel and Dr. Anup K. Singh, without whose support this program would not have been made possible. The vision of Professor Pokharyal is the driving force behind this program as well as the unending support extended by Professor Barnes. To both of them, I extend my gratitude. This program would also not have been possible without the unending support of the Assistant Registrar, Ramesh Sir, Digan Sir, Nimit Sir, and Fayaz Sir. And they have been a backbone for the successful conduct of the program. Last but not the least, no program is successful without the audience and the students for whom this program is meant for. I sincerely thank each and every one of you for participating in today's session. Thank you so much. Have a good day to all those in America and the other parts of the world, and a good night to everybody in India. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.